Hey, Anchor Community, Pastor Brian here, and we are continuing to go through this rebuilding teaching series. And uh, if you haven't been with us for a while, this is what it means to be a rebuilder, this word that we've been using throughout this teaching series. Being a rebuilder is someone that, like, you look at the world's brokenness, you look at the pain, whether it's relational pain, something in your workplace, something in your family, something in your finances, something in your spiritual life, or something in somebody else's finances, somebody else's spiritual life, somebody else's family, somebody else's uh, workplace, and you don't see that thing there as normative, walk by it, say it doesn't matter, that's just how things are here, but you move towards it. Bringing the hope of God, believing that the kingdom of God will show up as you live by faith, walk towards it and pray, bringing hope there. A rebuilder looks at the world's brokenness and doesn't see it as normative, but sees it as something that God wants to restore. This is what a rebuilder is. And throughout this teaching series, Rebuilding, we've been looking at the life of Nehemiah and picking up threads of wisdom and insight that God has deposited in this book as we survey and look at the life of Nehemiah. And today we are uh, finding that same thing in Nehemiah chapter 6. It's going to be up on the screen as we go through it today. You might want to have your Bible open so you can look at it. Um, but recently I was talking to a friend uh, a young leader who's at this like crossroads of his own leadership development. And he said something profound to me. He goes, you know, I'm going to have to make some decisions here soon. And I know whatever decision I make is a yes that will mean that other things are a no. He knew that he's going to have to make a decision that would be a yes to one thing and then consequently a no to other things. You know, this is, happens in all of our lives. You're heading away to college. The fact that you apply to this school, you go to this school is a yes. That means no to all the other schools that I'm sure you got accepted to. If you're going to a homecoming as a high schooler and you say yes to somebody who asks you to homecoming, that's a yes that means a no to other possible homecoming dates. If you buy a home, that's a yes to the, and to the no that all the other potential homes or places or whatever that you could have moved. Every major yes is also a no. Perhaps most like striking is like with marriage. This is a big yes that means a no to any other possible suitor. And like you could say that most of our personal life, like the havoc in our personal life, or the challenges around the world zooming out come to this real point where somebody has said yes, but they're not living like that was their yes to that one thing. And so they're living in a way that they're also trying to say yes over here too. Whether it's related to marriage, relationships, or budget, or whatever. Now, Nehemiah is onto something in chapter 6. He knows his one thing. And it's very clear. In fact, you know, like it goes all the way back like months for Nehemiah when he first hears about the broken walls in Jerusalem in chapter one, when his brothers tell him what had happened in Jerusalem. The walls are broken. That means in the ancient world, if you've been with us for a while, you're exposed to marauders at the mercy of thieves. And Nehemiah knows that this is, it's heartbreaking for him. He has what we call a holy heartbreak. And so he talks to King Artaxerxes and King Artaxerxes not only gives him permission to go, but gives him resources to rebuild the wall. This is Nehemiah's one thing. And Nehemiah's one thing means that because he said yes to this thing, it means other things have to hear the word no. Now, this is incredibly important for us to understand. Now, I'm pressing into the Nehemiah story a little bit more, is that like because Nehemiah is so compelled by this one thing, saying yes to this one thing, it gives him the ability to endure opposition when he may have been tempted to say, yes to his fatigue or yes to being defeated or yes to being depleted or yes to the opposition because maybe it's not worth it. But his, his commitment to the one thing and his yes to that one thing means he can continually say no to anything that would compete with that one thing. You could say this, not committing to that way, not committing to the rebuilding of the wall 
meant something that he couldn't stomach. If he didn't live out with a robust yes towards the rebuilding of the wall, he would not be able to live with himself. That's how he began, I imagine, to really know the one thing, the one thing that was worthy of his yes. So let me ask you this question as a potential guide for us to begin to really start thinking about what is the one thing in my life? And if we're to be kind of honest, maybe get into the kind of like nitty gritty, there probably are a few different one things. Though later on in the teaching, I'll be arguing that there really is ultimately one. But if you look at your life in a granular way, there are probably multiple one things. A one thing for my relational life or for my marriage, one thing for my budget, a one thing for my time. And so, but the guy, the question is still true is how do I discern those things? Because when I know the one thing in those different areas of my life, I know what to say yes to and I know what to say no to. Here's one way to begin to understand what your one thing is and what the thing that is worthy of your yes is. It's this, where, there, where is there potential for great win or great loss? Where is there potential for great win or great loss? You know, there are many, uh, or I could say history is filled with deathbed confessions of, I chased the wrong thing. Maybe you know someone. Maybe you've watched that movie where there's that moment at the twilight of a person's life where they confess and they come to terms with the fact that they've chased the wrong thing. They've given their yes to the wrong thing where they realized the pursuit of fame, acclaim, wealth, love, power, uh, really were just something that they were pursuing to assuage their own insecurities and wounds. And that pursuing wealth, fame, acclaim, power, love, whatever, was something that it was intoxicating to them, but was really something that kept them. Their yes to that thing kept them from saying yes to the more important things. Where is their potential for great loss or great reward? It typically isn't in the areas of being wealthy and noticed and, and, and sought after as an expert and whatever. Though that is often what we chase. That's often what we kind of de facto say yes to, what has our heart and our attention. But it's often typically not the thing that, where there's the potential for great loss or great reward. David Brooks, in his book, um, Second Mountain, uh, he talks about how lots of people have this life of climbing this first mountain, which he calls the mountain of ego, where we're trying to prove ourselves. We're trying to demonstrate how great we are. We're trying to, to accomplish something. And then he says that every, the people that climb, that are able to summit this first mountain, they get to the top of this mountain and they realize there's still something vacuous inside and unsettled in their heart. And so the rest of their life is going down into a valley of recognition, but then climbing the mountain, what he calls, I believe, of service and sacrifice, of chasing the thing that is more important, more significant. Many of us, we don't get to that point. Nehemiah has, he's uh, figured it out. He's understood what's the one thing that's worth it. Like if you're gonna be a rebuilder, we have to be people that like live with, at least with this question in our hearts or in our journals or in our conversations, in our prayer life. God, like what's the one thing? Like what's the thing that's gonna be worthy of a yes? There's an answer there in your relational life. There's an answer there in your financial life. There's an answer there in your calendar, in your time and how you spend your time. And like rebuilders are thinking about that. They're wrestling with that. They know where there is the potential for great loss and then also great reward. And they're bringing this tension and this question to prayer, uh, to God in prayer and to conversation with people that are interested in, in their flourishing. 
so the the thing that we have to ask is okay so if if life is filled with all like all these potential yeses and potential noes and potential one things in our life how do we discern distraction and how do we turn down distraction Nehemiah chapter 6 uh, verses 1 to 4 it says when word came to Sambalat Tobiah Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates. Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Now, okay, just stopping there. Any Anytime somebody that's opposed to you says, hey, let's meet in the place called Ono, that's a dead giveaway. Oh no, that's a dead giveaway. <laughs> uh, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with them in reply, I am carrying on, now write this down, think about this, memorize this one. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Now, I'm gonna we'll go back to that verse. I'm carrying on a great project. I cannot go down to you. Uh, my wife has uh, written on uh, our fridge, it says, I am, carry, I, am, I am doing a good work and I cannot come down. She needs that verse as she thinks about her life with our kiddos parenting or her life with her pursuit of Jesus. Her li you know, she has that verse in her mind because knowing there are so many things that are trying to take us from the one thing that is significant. I am doing a great work. He says it four times because there's four times of distraction. I'm doing a great work. I'm committing myself to something of significance. There's so much coming at me that would, would take me away from the one thing, the way we have clarity of mind when we're in a situation where distractions are coming at us is we have clarity of what's the one thing? What's the thing that is worthy of my energy, that is worthy of my time, that is worthy of my prayer, that is worthy of my sacrifice? And anything that competes with that one thing is not worthy of my time, energy, time, sacrifice, and prayer. You know, it's interesting, Nehemiah could have um, seen this as an opportunity. He could have kind of wrote a story in his head that finally Sam Bilet has come around. Finally, he's recognized that, that, that I have actually something to give to the world. Finally, he's seen that I, I too have notoriety, that, I, that I, have, I have worth. And finally, he's recognized that. That's probably what he wants to talk about, how he can come to some agreement because he's recognized that I have power, that I'm significant. He could have, I mean, there's, that's a possible script that Nehemiah could have written in his head when these messages keep coming to him, when the ladder gets rattled. Hey, Nehemiah, get off the wall. There's another message from Sam Bollett. It would have been easy for Nehemiah to write a story about, hey, this actually would be a great networking opportunity with a, a neighboring leader. How does he discern that it is not an opportunity, but it's a distraction? That's something that not would reinforce the one thing, but actually compete with the one thing. Well, I'm guessing, we don't have all the indications of this, but looking at the total story, we have some glimpses. The first is what, what I would say is, he probably examines the source. Does this person, thing, idea have a track record, <laughs> right? Does this person thing idea have a track record? And what does that track record say? Sam Ballet had a track record of opposing and deceiving and, and attacking, demeaning. You know, it's not always the, the, the most fun truth, but, but a business professor, a friend of mine, says that the greatest indicator um, of past or a future behavior is past behavior. <laughs> so if you want to if you want to understand where something could go, look at how it's behaved in the past. And unless there's an interruption of, and a transformation uh, with that person, that thing, or what have you, there's no indication that 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 thing or person or belief will act differently than it did in the past. 
So if we're gonna be discerning distraction in our own life, we have to probably do like Nehemiah did, where we have to, when a distraction, when something comes our way and we're like, is this an opportunity or a distraction? Does this reinforce my one thing or take me away from the one thing? We have to ask the question, how has this person thought, idea, uh, practice, whatever, how has it behaved in the past? How has it, has it taken me or others I know towards flourishing or has it taken us away from flourishing or others I know? And when you start to answer that question, you begin to have an idea of this is a distraction or is it an opportunity? Second thing that we see Nehemiah doing is, is that we not only examine the source, but we evaluate the outcome. If I did this, what would happen next, right? And so Nehemiah says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why would the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? In verse four, he says, like, I, like, I can't stop working on this. This is something of so, such significance that it means that, that like, I can't entertain whatever that, even if it is an opportunity, it's, it's not an opportunity that is worth taking me away from, from this work. He says the outcome of going down there would mean that I, I'm not up here. And if I'm not up here, the work isn't going to continue in the way that it needs to continue. So some opportunities are not always God's open doors. And some opportunities, we, they, they, they may actually be opportunities, but they're actually really distractions because they don't move the ball forward enough to warrant us leaving the one thing. I know friends who, they've had to cancel a subscription because even though it's something that may, in some ways, give life-giving and fun and relaxing, the subscription, whether it's on television or an app, actually in some ways competes with their attention for the one thing that is most pressing in their life, the thing they want to give the yes to. I know other people who say, I, I'm not, I can't go to that place anymore. Whether it's a bar or a club, even if it's friends that I love and, and, and that love me, I can't, I can't personally go to that place anymore. Because my yes to that means I'm kind of probably going to start saying no to the thing I really want to say yes to. The opportunity isn't God's open door, and it really is just a distraction. The trick, the trick to avoiding the painful and, to, um, and traumatic distraction of an affair is working on your marriage and fanning the flames of your marriage. That's the trick. The trick to not spending any more money on those stupid app subscriptions or the second day five bucks Starbucks, right, is falling in love with the idea of a family vacation and budgeting accordingly for that or an early retirement or a first home. The trick to not getting sucked into the Instagram or YouTube vortex is th uh, through falling in love with the idea of spending time with those you love or Sabbath, or margin, and seeing the, all those things as sacred. So the trick to really saying no to the thing that might feel like an opportunity, but it's not God's open door, it's really a distraction, the trick to that is falling in love with the thing that you've said yes to. The trick to avoiding distraction is knowing your one thing. This is Nehemiah's trick. It's knowing is one thing. This is what Christian writers of past have called, in a way, the expulsive, expulsive, sorry, the expulsive power of a greater affection. The expulsive power of a greater affection. Christian writers in the past taught, used this idea, the expulsive power of a greater affection. And by that, they meant that the way to really grow in your relationship with God is not just like, reading your Bible more, though that helps, or praying more, though that helps, but really deep inside falling in love with God more, paying attention to who he is, his character and his nature, how he's um, sacrificed himself for you. When you understand that more, that pushes anything that would compete with it away. So similarly, the one thing, that you're yes to the one thing, like, and, and saying no to things that would compete with it means falling in love with the thing that you've said yes to. Whether it's 
something within your relationships or in your budget or time or whatever. And this is where, this is where it's important. I, w- I want us to pay attention here. Of course, not that you weren't in the first place. But it, the, the ultimate goal, and this is where I want us to understand that really in the end, for followers of Jesus, there is ultimately just one, one thing. The ultimate goal is not to be a person that is just, you know, has a put together marriage, is good financially, and is really good at time management. That's not, that's, those are all great things. Who doesn't want that? But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal, and here's why. The, that's, why that's not the ultimate goal, because if that was the ultimate goal, you could do all those things and be an inflexible jerk, right? You can do all those things and be just mean-spirited. You could do all those things and be arrogant. Look at me, look what I've done. The ultimate goal, the ultimate one thing, the ultimate thing that that you wanna give your biggest yes to, that will reorganize all of your life, is your discipleship to Jesus and the Spirit's inside-out transformation of you. Because when when that is your ultimate yes, it has a reorganizing power, not of just of how you treat others in relationships, whether it's those really close or those far, and not how you st- steward your money, not just how you steward your money, not just how you manage your time, though that is implied in all, that, that is a part of following Jesus. It, f- it flows into all of those things. But, but really, when you, when you give Jesus, when your discipleship to Jesus and the Spirit's inside-out transformation work of your life, when that's your biggest one thing, you start to do all those things in a way with humility. Humility. You start to do, engage in all those things in a way of love. It not only reorganizes all of the areas of your life, but it, but it reorganizes your heart as well. So you know that uh, because of God's mercy to me, I'm able to think and live in these ways. And so I shouldn't have arrogance. I should be humble. When your discipleship to Jesus and the Spirit's inside-out transformation work of you is your one thing, then it not only speaks about how you should engage with relationships in all areas of your life, but it does so in a way where it brings an attitude marked by transformation. This is what Paul says, Philippians 3.13. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining what is ahead, this is my one thing. This is my one thing. Yeah, of course, there are smaller one things. How I love people, the people in my life, how I treat for Paul, how he would treat Timothy. How we, You know, there's other one things, you know, how the yeses that I'm saying yes to that are no's to other things. But the ultimate yes is that I have said yes to Jesus. And anything that would compete with that is a big no. Because when I said yes to Jesus, all areas of my life are reorganized towards love and good deeds, towards stewardship and consideration of those vulnerable and those close to me. I love how the message paraphrase says it, where it says, I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I've made it, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Can I just say this is the way of the rebuilder? The rebuilder is, is doesn't just have a good life plan of how to do relationships well and money and time. And though we need that, the but the ult the rebuilder ultimately, the rebuilder ultimately is captivated by the master builder's plan. And that knowing that there is no hope for the world except for the one who made the world and and loves the world and gave himself for the world. So the only one worthy of the ultimate yes is the one who is worthy of honor and glory, who is holy. This is the heart of the rebuilder, that they would carry that truth, not uh, not with arrogance, but with humility, knowing that they have received grace. I love when Nehemiah, he faces this distraction 
and he and he's 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 he kind of you get the sense that he's defeated and maybe worn down by it a little bit. The four times of him having to continually say the same thing, he's he's thrown off. And in verse nine, he says, "They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will be not be completed." And it says, as he goes on, "But I prayed. Now strengthen my hands." This might be your prayer. That if you find yourself tempted, worn down by the, hey, the, the things that seem like opportunities but aren't God's open doors, if you find yourself in, like Jesus did in the wilderness where there's Satan saying, hey, wouldn't you like this? Wouldn't you like this? But you know, if saying yes to that means saying no to what the Father's calling you towards, if you find yourself in situations like that, like Jesus did, like Nehemiah did, you might pray the prayer of Nehemiah, God, strengthen my hands. Strengthen my hands, strengthen my resolve, strengthen my heart, steady my gaze, keep me focused on the truly important one thing. I love it. in verse 14, I, in, after verse nine, it should be said that there's continued onslaught against Nehemiah and against the rebuilding efforts. In fact, it gets more aggressive. They seek to kill Nehemiah and they bring him into, embroil him into a plot. Nehemiah sees through it. And in verse 14, it says, uh, remember Tobiah and Sambalat. This is classic Nehemiah just sharing, is kind of venting his prayer to God. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet, no idea. I love that idea, or I love that name, no idea. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but I love the idea that this bad prophet is named to no idea, or no idea, I don't know. And how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed. Get that. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. So what happens is Nehemiah like Nehemiah commits to the one thing. He discerns distraction. And as he continues, as he sets himself in this way, the way of a rebuilder, saying yes to the one thing, discerning distraction, uh, turning down distraction, he starts to see the fruit. This is what everybody experiences when they commit to the one thing and they turn down distraction. They see fruit. A counselor will tell you this, that, that pain, painful memories are more memorable than joyful memories. Just as Eskimos have uh, many words for snow, one psychologist has said that, that the human experience, you know, like we have, we have many ways of remembering trauma. It's more sticky. It's more memorable. And so it's easy for us, easy for us to not see the fruit and not celebrate the win. Um, but it's important. Um, we at our staff meetings here at Anchor, one of the first things we do uh, is we 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 have this time of celebrations where it's open to anybody in the room. What are we celebrating today? And when we first started doing this, there was kind of like silence, like. Uh, I don't know, celebrate, what are we celebrating? But now it's this thing that at least I, and I think many others on, the, on our team, get excited about to share the things that we see God doing, the things that is advancing the mission of Anchor. And, and it really becomes something where we're seeing the fruit at the beginning of this meeting. Here's the thing, because a lot of times in life, in, 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 on our team, in, 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 area of, in, area of, in, area, in every area of life, we experience opposition challenge and all that kind of stuff. So we have to commit to the discipline of celebration celebration, the discipline of seeing the fruit, the pointing to the fact that, hey, we've committed to this one thing. We've turned down distraction. Now look at this awesome stuff. Nehemiah's like, hey, the wall got completed. He takes note of that. The wall got completed. For you, there's, there's walls in your life where you're saying, you have to point to it. You have to say, look at that. We celebrated our third anniversary. It was a rocky year but we celebrated our third anniversary. We've seen God's faithfulness. We've managed our budget. Yeah, we blew out one category. Well, we did better than last month. 
I've committed to praying for three weeks straight. And sometimes it's been a five minute prayer. Sometimes it's been 30 minutes of prayer and reflection, but, but I've committed to it. And, and you start to celebrate the wins and see the fruit. And when you commit to the one thing and you turn down distraction, and what that does is you see more indications of God's faithfulness and you get more excited for more. Because there's always more fruit if you continue walking that path. Sometimes it's like the fruit is early on for Nehemiah, where, where he's being criticized because the wall, it looks like a fox could knock it down. But, but Nehemiah's like, actually, I'm kind of excited. We got that far. And that's the fruit. Sometimes it's a half-built wall that you're like, that's a half-built wall. <laughs> and I'm excited about that. Sometimes it's a wall that it doesn't have any doors on it. Just like at the beginning of this chapter. Hey, there's no doors there, but look at the walls are complete. They're just not doors. Like, look how awesome that is. Celebrate that stuff. Look to the, at the areas of your life and celebrate the wins that you see because they're indications of God's faithfulness to you and of your pursuit after him. We have to be good observers of the fruit in our life, celebrating it. Sometimes we need to point to other people's fruit and say, do you see that? Because I see that, and that's an indication that you've committed to the one thing and you've turned down distraction. I just want to point to that. I want to name that. I want to tell you that I see the fruit in your life. I mean, rebuilders need to be cheering each other on and encouraging each other with that stuff. Okay, let me just tell you this really, really important point as we close. How do we get the, how do you, how do you, maybe you're listening to this and you're like, okay, one thing. I, how do I find, how do I do, how do I, how do I see the fruit? How do I get to the one thing? How do I, like, I, you've told me some helpful stuff, Brian, but how do I, how do I do this? How do I even get to the point where, like, my, my discipleship to Jesus and, the, like, the Holy Spirit's work in me is something that I actually desire? How do I get to the point where, like, I'm wanting that as my one thing? Let me tell you this. It may not be instantaneously. It may not be all at once. But beginning to see Jesus as your one thing begins with this, believing that Jesus, that God, has set himself, his heart, his eyes on you as his one thing. When you understand that he has set his attention on you, that he has set his gaze on you, that you are his one thing, yeah, the critic could say, well, well, there's others that he loves too, but yeah, he loves you. His attention is on you. He died for you. All the things that you're ashamed of, all the things that you're hiding, all the things that you regret, in God's eyes, because of the cross, they're not anything that competes for his attention. They're not anything that has captured his attention. He sees you. You are his one thing. And when you understand that, at the core of who you are, that everything that you're ashamed of, all the guilt that is echoes in your brain, in God's eyes, is done away with. When you get that, you're his one thing. And then slowly or quickly, it becomes a joy to set him as your one thing.